Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CNE Sales Monthly Webinar Series. I'm Jeff Butler, the Technical Manager here at CNE. Today's webinar is titled Fluid Power versus Electric, Electric Actuation, the Pros and Cons, and we'll focus on the differences between the two technologies. Our presenter today is Jay Swank, Motion Specialist here at CNE. Jay's been with us for six years, and he's been working in the field of industrial automation his entire career. So just a few housekeeping items before we start. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them using the control panel tool on the right side of your screen, and we'll address them at the end of the session. If you don't see that tool, click on the red horizontal arrow and it should open up for you. Everyone registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording, so if you're trying to take notes or something and you get distracted, don't worry about it. You'll be able to come back and watch it later. Uh, please be sure to attend next month's webinar. It's hosted by John Pipkin of CNE Sales, and his topic will be using the Smart Access Module to commission your G120 VFD. So that's a Siemens Variable Frequency Drive that has a Smart Access Module, with, which will allow you to be able to use a web server uh, and your smartphone to configure your drive. That webinar will be hosted on September 13th at 10.30. I'll now turn today's webinar over to Jay. All right. Thank you, Jeff. So, uh, you know, I'd like to start with with uh, maybe how we're going, you know, wh where this vision of this webinar came from, and then also with an apology. I know this this webinar was marketed as more of a vlog style approach, and unfortunately, we we had some technical difficulties with testing, with video update update rates and audio quality. So, watch the CNE Sales YouTube channel for for that video and that uh, we, we believe that media will be better. That should be up here in the, the somewhat near future. But for today, we're going to go with a, a traditional webinar style approach. Sort of where this came from, uh, as I segue into that, you know, as a motion specialist for CNE Sales, I'm regularly uh, requested to look at both hydraulic and pneumatic applications for the migration into electric actuators for for both new applications and existing. Um, in some cases, actually in many cases, it makes a lot of sense, but there are some places where it just makes uh, sense currently to go ahead and stay with a pneumatic actuator or a hydraulic system. Um, what I wanted to try to do was talk about the systems grossly and help uh, help you come to the conclusion you know, does it make sense to, to, to look at it? Does it not? And, and maybe how can you update both efficiency and productivity with looking at the electric solution? So with that, I, I broke this into really four sections and the way I'll, I will make comparisons and, and topics for conversation. The first being the, the system components and complexity uh, of the systems. The next is for the motion control capabilities. Then I'll move into environmental impacts and operating cost of the individual systems. And lastly, we'll talk about service life and maintenance uh, requirements or, or expectations for them. To kick that off, I'll jump into the system components and complexity specifically for pneumatic actuation. Pneumatic actuation is often thought about as being one of the, the more simplistic or a very simple form of actuation in automation. And really, once you get down to the cylinder and maybe even that solenoid level, I would agree with that. The what's often not realized because it's already present in a facility is all of the all of the upstream requirements uh, and needs. You know, you, you've got at least one compressor in many facilities. There are several rather large compressors running. You're going to have some um, some storage, uh, usually a good sized tank dehumidifiers, filters, lubrication, and rather extensive plumbing all before you get to your point of use. Once you're at that point of use, not only do you have just your control valve and the solenoid um, with additional plumbing, but you know there's usually sensors, a PLC, and more to actually control that pneumatic actuator. Um, as far as the actuation itself, we're going to actually control its movement with flow controls, the cylinder, and those flow controls we'll talk about extensively later. Moving into hydraulic actuation, you know, it uh, it's similar in a lot of ways to pneumatic in that we, we have a lot of upstream preparation uh, for the power generation prior to actually being able to utilize or move that actuator. Uh, 
One difference being is that with pneumatics, typically you have air production done at facility level, whereas with hydraulics, you'll be at machine or rather um, localized energy production. So what we have here, you know, your motor, your pump, your tank, relief valves, strainers, filters, all of those kind of things are going to be usually in several uh, multiple uh, multiples. So sometimes you'll see see one tank run several stations, but a lot of times it's a it's a per point of use where where this will take place. The control itself is similar with sensors and things. We do have that manifold, and I've listed here both you know a valve and typical solenoid thinking about bang bang technology but i will also be be discussing um both proportional and hydro and um servo valve uh, options with this hydraulic so not always will we have the the same type of sensing in fact we may have encoders or transducers if using a proportional or servo valve actuation itself with speeds Again, we're still really using flow controls. Those may be at valve level, sometimes somewhere in the line uh, due to fluid compression and, and differences in uh, hose flex. Uh, you may put them out closer on the cylinder as well. And then we've got that cylinder. A system not often thought about that's um, is the servo pump or hybrid system. And there's a couple flavors of it as well. In many cases, it's similar to your hydraulics. We still have a pump and motor. We've got a drive. In some cases, we'll have a tank uh, filter, still have the chilling, and there's still going to be plumbing. Um, to skip forward a bit, I've listed with different colors here, sort of a blue, if you can see the manifold, valve, transducer, encoder, those type of components. And the reason for that is there's there's really two ways that you can approach a servo pump hydraulic system or a hybrid system. One, and is what's usually the most common, especially in uh, injection molding, is where we see one servo motor or some sort of variable speed motor then coupled to a, rather than a vein pump or a, a, uh, a slip pump where we're pushing oil across a, uh, a relief valve for consistent pressure regulation, instead we go to a, a really high, a high efficiency with not much loss, a gear style pump. And whenever we need to have fluid movement, the servo will just ramp up to move that fluid as needed. Two ways this gets employed. One is a single axis, and in many cases, those are going to be that they're going to be completely sealed, where uh, we're really moving one actuator per pump. Sometimes you can have multiple pumps on a motor, but you'll have one actuator per pump. And as the pump moves one direction, we move fluid one way. The, let's, in this case, we'll say the cylinder would extend. When we change directions, that cylinder retracts. Not as common, but uh, another possibility for that is where that same high efficiency gear pump is supplying oil to a manifold similar to you would use in a traditional hydraulic system. We monitor that manifold pressure and then simply ramp up to speed or slow down based on the pressure of that manifold. When an actuator moves, let's say a, a valve opens, uh, that pressure will drop as fluid begins to move in the system and find its way back to a tank, and the motor would quickly ramp up to supply that uh, that fluid to try to achieve a, a nominal manifold pressure. The advantage to this is that now rather than having one pump per axis, you can control multiples with whatever you can stack up on your manifold. I've seen four uh, to six relatively common with that, uh, with that. We can also use proportional and servo valves with that type of system. Finally, we'll talk about the electric actuation. There's really not a lot to these systems. Uh, specifically here, I'm talking about your cylinder types of actuators or a rod type of uh, actuation. So we're really just looking at a ball screw inside of some type of housing that pushes a rod out. In many ways, it has a very similar footprint to... Um, your other form of actuators, but our motor is going to be directly coupled to that, and then we're just going to have a drive running back off uh, off into an electrical cabinet, or in some cases we can do a distributed drive on the motor or there outside or local to the machine. Everything gets a, a little simpler without having the to first generate the power uh, of the hydraulic or pneumatics. The biggest consideration that I've already alluded to is when you have a pneumatic cylinder or even a hydraulic, uh, 
the actual space on the machine is much different than what you would have with an electric actuation. The cylinder itself, you know, we're just looking at a size for a, the amount of pressure we want to create times the length. And, and honestly, the pneumatics, is, it's, it's all pretty small and contained right, right there within it. Same for hydraulics, usually bigger. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but uh, the footprint inside the machine is somewhat smaller when compared to an electric actuator. The electric actuator is similar for the cylinder piece, but now we're mounting a motor to it. We do have some tricks to come up with potential real estate issues. One of the most common things for a length concern would be to do what's called a reverse parallel. Uh, the reverse parallel brings that motor back along the actuator somewhere, and it helps with that total length. Alternately, if that is the problem, I've had some instances where we uh, install a much longer actuator than would have been used for the cylinder. The advantage there is that we can get that motor real estate in line or reverse parallel, but maybe further outside of that, that area of concern. As I move into the motion control capabilities, um, one other consideration to start thinking about is speed versus force when we look at these different types of systems. Not necessarily aligned in any particular order where I've got the Ferrari versus the Kenworth, but with any form of fluid power, your speed is a product of the total volume of fluid we're moving, and force is a separate target, and that's going to be what sort of pressure we can make in the area of the piston that we're pushing. Those are two separate targets, and we can sort of independently um, change those. When we look at electric power, speed and force are linked. So as I mentioned, we, we usually have a ball screw and a rod style actuator, and the best way for me to be fast would be to have a screw pitch with a rather, you know, a rather steep screw pitch on that, and then that's not necessarily the best for high force. Alternately, if I get a really a really steep pit or a really fine pitch screw, I can make a lot of force, but it's more difficult to move as quickly. That being said, if I just look at tolematic rod cylinders alone, we can achieve up to 236 inches a second with uh, an LZT actuator. It's actually a belt inside of an actuator that moves a rod. It's kind of coined named the, uh, the lizard tongue with the LZT, and it's really quick. Not going to make anywhere near the forces, though, that we can see with like the Tolematic RSX that gets all the way up to 30,000 pounds force. So, again, we can go fast. We can push really hard. A lot of times we have to look at the application to find out, can we get that happy medium where the electric actuator will still meet uh, production requirements? Now, to take a little bit deeper dive into the motion control capabilities, I'm also going to break that down into position control capability, position accuracy or repeatability, velocity control, our control of acceleration, deceleration, and then the control of output force. I will also be discussing the maintenance factors. I know that, um, that but I'll be doing that here at a little bit, little bit later point. So to dive in, uh, in the same order, we'll begin with the uh, pneumatic actuation. Position control for most pneumatic actuation is just to fix stops. Uh, it's going to go to it hits a hard stop on one end and then go back to another hard stop. I have seen several um, applications where intermediate positions are made one of two ways. Either there's another pneumatic cylinder that interjects a midpoint hard stop uh, and then would retract for the full extent. I've also seen applications where a smaller cylinder is opposed to a larger cylinder and it would stroke out and then maybe the larger cylinder that would have more force literally back drives it to a midpoint. Those are usually quite cumbersome and, and um, don't work that well, but again, when you were really, really small and, and strapped for real estate, it can be the best way to, to look at that. Position accuracy, because we're traveling to hard stops, honestly, it's I would consider it very good. In fact, um, I'll talk about it more when we get back to the maintenance, and that's why I had the little bubble there. Provided we have a good air supply and it's clean and dry, there's no moisture or anything that would keep us from getting to that hard stop. You're not going to get a lot better. Velocity control is done with those flow controls. I would call that unreliable at best. Um, most application systems that I come across, it, uh, if, when I ask how often are you having to adjust those flow controls to keep the velocity where you'd like, and it, it's usually 
quite often. It does depend largely on the variances that are acceptable in the process, but if you really need a system to happen in a certain amount of time, I do see these tweaked with often. Again, this goes back to humidity changes, temperature changes, all of that will affect, uh, affect how that air moves through that flow control, and that's why you end up adjusting it regularly. Control of acceleration and deceleration for pneumatics, really there are none. Uh, you can The only way that you would get that would be with a cushion or like a little small hydraulic cushion where prior to hitting that hard stop, you're going to come in contact with a little cushion and then as that strokes in, fluid pressure, sealed fluid pressure in that cushion compresses and it slows the axis down. The problem is I've seen where those cushions suddenly become the hard stop and there's not quite enough force in the cylinder with flow controls reduced to push all the way to that hard stop and then comes back to that position accuracy. Um, so in many cases there's a, a little degradation of that when those cushions are put in place. Control of output force is done with regulation of pressure and again sort of similar changes to air quality and differences in humidity and temperature. I would call that somewhat unreliable. Moving into your traditional hydraulic system for position control, again, for your bang bang regular solenoid valves, we're traveling usually to fixed stops or end of travel on the cylinder. Intermediate positions are possible now if we add in proportional or servo valves. Of course, that means that we're going to add some system complexity to add in position monitoring, either with transducers or some sort of encoder. Position accuracy, even for those intermediates with proportional or servo valves, can be very good. I've seen some where, um, you know, two thousandths of an inch, depending on the uh, the valve null setting and how how well that can be done, as well as with the the zero overlap. You know, it's not it's sort of theoretical, but but depending on the valve overlap and how well that is set to null, if you have a uh, a single rotted cylinder, uh, it can be very good. Velocity control, again, good, but that velocity control is going to come in the form of usually proportional or servo valves if it's really needed very, you know, um, to be overly tight. The reason even with a flow control, I would believe hydraulics to be better than pneumatics is that the medium itself, um, provided you're keeping your temperatures under control or somewhat consistent, it seems to move uh, a little more consistently through a flow control. Control of acceleration and deceleration, similar to pneumatics, but now because we have the proportional or servo valve options, we can create ramps uh, and, and get some acceleration deceleration control. Control of output force and monitoring, uh, adjustable largely with regulation uh, of fluid pressure, a little bit more consistent with uh, hydraulic as a, as a fluid medium, but um, Still, uh, what you have to worry about is the inertia of a mechanism moving forward can sometimes create some inertia or a coining effect at the end of travel. Looking at the servo pump or hybrid actuation for, uh, for the uh, control capabilities. Travel to fixed stocks, I, you know, I put common here. I have seen quite a few, but that's really not where the strengths of this type of actuation would play in. Intermediate stops are absolutely possible. Um, both open loop and closed loop, you can do some timing. I've seen that. I, I don't know that uh, it was a pretty loose position when that's happened, but because we have that high, you know, that high efficiency or the precision gear uh, motor, that when the motor moves, it's moving a very consistent amount of fluid. So I have seen applications where we know the volume of the the hoses, we know the volume of the cylinder, and we can actually calculate the number of revs that the pump would need to make to have moved a certain amount of fluid to put the position of the cylinder in a somewhat close position. That can really be tightened up with uh, with either a transducer or encoder to actually monitor the real world position. Both of those cases are possible with either that single axis where uh, it's a closed loop system or whether you're going to a manifold. If you are going to the manifold, it would you would need to close the position. You wouldn't be able to just simply uh, calculate the amount of fluid movement. Position accuracy and repeatability, very good. It's going to be at least as good as the traditional hydraulic system and only be improved with the additional, uh, with, the, with the more reliable pump mechanism and the fact we're turning that with a servo or a, a, a little more consistent motor. 
Velocity control is excellent. Again, the sky's the limit. Servo motors like to spool up uh, fairly quickly, and we can get a lot more speed than you're going to get out of a typical induction motor if you're doing it with a VFD, and that directs the results to how quickly we can move that fluid. A lot of times you can have that gear pump be a lot smaller than you would have with a you know a variable a vein pump or something like that uh, because we're capitalizing on 100% fluid movement rather than shearing some off of a relief valve. Control of acceleration, deceleration, again, as good if not better now, now the, uh, the way we're moving that fluid of a traditional hydraulic system. And control of output force, again, good. This somewhat, uh, I would have a caveat here, it depends on the update rate and reaction times to our pressure monitoring. Same with some of those speed things. Uh, if we want to control output force, uh, uh, in many cases I see people wanting to use the servo motor. Uh, it's current output directly relates to the torque that the motor is putting out and they want to kind of calculate that backwards. Just keep in mind it's always in reaction to force that it has already occurred, one, and then two, um, we do have a lot of mechanics out there that kind of degrades the, um, the capability of that. Electric actuation, I'm going to go ahead and just throw all of these up here, not to toot our own horn since we tend to really stay focused on the electric actuation, but position control, position accuracy, repeatability, velocity control, all of it, it's going to be really quite excellent with uh, electric actuation. The sky's the limit on all of those. Control of output force, the only reason I listed very good here instead of um, excellent, for the same reasons I mentioned with the servo pump, if we're using that motor to actually to actually its current or torque that it's putting out to calculate how much force the actuator is putting out. There's gear train and, and mechanics out there ahead of it. And it's also going to be have already occurred before we can see that number. This can pretty easily be fixed by adding a, a load cell to measure real world forces out there out at the actual actuation point. But then again, that could be done with all of the other methods we talked about earlier. So it's not a, a huge advantage there only for electric actuation. Now, I alluded to it a little bit, another consideration for motion control capability, uh, temperature tolerance becomes a, a really big factor for both your fluid powers. If we look at pneumatics for a little bit and even look outside your window, for, for us here in Dayton, uh, it's raining quite a bit. You get a lot of humidity differences with that anytime we go from cold to hot or hot to cold with a weather front. And that actually will happen inside the pipes and plumbing of your pneumatic system that condensation or humidity can build up even in the best of systems um, and, and that can really affect the, re, the reliability of your flow controls and some of those small orifices through regulation and those smaller cylinders. Even if you've got the best dryer, if it's all the way back where that air is being produced, I've seen uh, humidity at the machine level be a concern because a lot of times your plumbing is run along the ceiling and the drop from a 30 foot ceiling down to potentially an air conditioned or cooler floor area where the machine is at can sometimes be enough to create condensation in the line. Of course, you could add extra things there at the uh, at the machine to resolve with that, but still it's it's happening. Likewise, with the oil side, hot to cold has drastic changes in viscosity. So when it gets really hot, we start to have to having some sort of heat exchanger or cooler to keep that oil in an operating temperature. That heat is also being generated just by process. Again, we've talked about that variable pump that has to run all the time in a typical hydraulic system. That pressure is being monitored by a relief valve. This, there's some oil shear there generating heat even when that system's sitting idle. Uh, the flip side of that, if we get really cold, oil is really thick and doesn't like to move, and it's very inconsistent, not only through the pump where the motor would have to work harder to get it going, but sometimes those cylinders don't move as consistently. All right, let's segue into the environmental impact and operating cost. Um, sort of an overall thought of this is every time you're converting energy, you're throwing away money. That's absolutely the case when we look at pneumatics. Pneumatics overall efficiency uh, very typically is going to be between 10 and 15 percent. Now, that makes it the most expensive source of, source of energy in the plant, and that's at the best of your systems. A lot of times if you're in a plant that has a lot of pneumatic actuation, you'll hear that hiss throughout the facility. That's leaks. 
that's money just going away uh, and that air movement itself does nothing to help with uh, the humidity and some of those other factors. Hydraulics is a little bit better. Uh, really, I, I found calculations when prepping for this webinar. I, I found people that had calculated numbers between 25 and 50 percent. And ultimately, uh, what was going on there with the variation was different types of application and where they mo where they monitored that efficiency and, and how they were monitoring it. I did find some inconsistent, but Really, if you think about it, uh, the best you're ever going to get is, is right around 50%. We're running a motor to produce oil, the oil uh, because that has to run all of the time. We're only using a small piece that didn't go over the pressure regulator. Most of the oil is, is typically going over the pressure regulator that really reduces that. Servo pump or that uh, uh, servo over oil or, you know, uh, that system is is much better at uh, 60 to 75 percent. A lot of that comes down to the fact that, again, we're, we're no longer have that relief valve. Just simply removing that and now having a motor that will turn only when oil movement is required is a, is a huge advantage. The best uh, is absolutely going to be electric actuation. Um, typical numbers between 80 and 85 percent efficient on your energy use. When you think about it, it's really the only system that's going to be a true uh, zero utilization on power generation at idle. All you would have is your control voltage that would exist on any other system. You're, you're typically 24 volts to sort of keep that uh, keep that monitored at idle. Now a lot of these at idle and operation. I tried to put a spreadsheet together here to 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 show that with duty cycle many of these change and you'll see these numbers sort of go down. So I took sort of the best case efficiency numbers of all of these systems and then plot it out if we're using it all the time what happens to that efficiency with higher duty cycle. Most of them are somewhat linear flat even though they're dropping over time. The one that really gets worse is that uh, hydraulic system. As it's used more and more it really does drop off on efficiency. Cost to deploy. I Tried, I put these in order in smallest to largest. I'll be honest, this is just sort of uh, opinion with where I've designed machines and design systems in the past and sort of an overall view. Pneumatics, I do believe, is the cheapest cost to deploy at machine level. If I remove that cost to generate that pneumatic power, assuming that it already exists in the facility, it's pretty cheap. Some small cylinders around that one inch and you know, maybe 10 to 8 to 10 inches of travel can be found for, you know, 20 to $30 and sensors and everything have become commodity items for that. That's why I've placed it at the top or the smallest cost of deploy. Hydraulic, honestly, the same thing. I've sort of assumed that there's already a power unit in place. That's a little bit uh, that's a little bit tougher assumption with hydraulics, but if we assume that that's already in place, the cylinders are relatively cheap, and again, sensors and everything to add that um, fall in line with that. Obviously, if we have to generate that air or we have to generate that hydraulic fluid, these absolutely would move down to the largest cost to deploy. The next two I really labored with, I did ultimately put electric actuation first. Uh, I did that thinking about that single axis, uh, and then I followed that up with a servo pump. My thought here was with a single axis, I'm going to have a servo motor, I'm going to have a servo drive, and I'm going to have some sort of actuator. While that actuator is more cost, I, I don't have other things that I would have like the pump and um, maybe a manifold. Um, but all of those, you know, cooling or anything else that you may have with that system. Now, if we looked at multi-axis system, I might move that servo pump up because we're going to have that servo motor and drive used across multiple axes. But depending on what you're doing there, those can be a, a wash. And again, if we had to generate power for this one axis, I would switch hydraulic and pneumatic all the way down to the bottom as well. When we're thinking about oil, what about all of that oil? Uh, it's, it's definitely something to think about. With a traditional hydraulic system, you're going to have at least a few gallons all the way up to a few hundred gallons for most installations. Um, that's a lot of oil. The oil itself is very expensive, but even more so is the recycling or what to do with that oil later in life. I know a lot of times it's not thought about or maybe it's covered under a facility side of the budget, but it is something to think about. In fact, 
one of the number one considerations for people wanting to move into electric actuation away from hydraulics has to come back to the cost management or just dealing with the oil aspect, even though they may be finding performance out of the actuator itself, there, itself that they're happy with. The next I would consider is, what about the what about the sound levels? What about all those audio impacts in the facility? Um, this is a really operator and, and, and team member environment are really big considerations now. And sort of the sweet spot that I see is the 80 decibel range. I was honestly surprised when I went to find real world numbers on typical pneumatic actuation systems on where those came in decibel wise, because I don't tend to think about that being an overly loud system especially when compared to the growl of a hydraulic pump and motor. I was surprised, though, that it happens to fall in a frequency that, while it may not seem loud, actually can be very loud. 74 to 110 decibels, that 110 decibels is nothing to fret about, and that's actually doing some, some pretty significant damage rather quickly to your ears. I was surprised to find numbers, though, as low as, in, you know, in the 70s. And, and really what I'm finding there, because this is such a hot topic and it's a big consideration, um, I'm, I noticed that there's a lot of valve manufacturers making newer and better mufflers and ways to exhaust that pneumatic air at a lower, uh, a lower sound level. Hydraulics, much more consistent between 85 and 95 decibels for the, the typical system. Most of that's going to come from the pump growl um, itself. Not a lot of uh, sound for the actual fluid movement, but the pump itself can make quite a bit of noise, as well as any chillers or heat exchangers that you have to dissipate that heat. Uh, they can have quite a bit of noise. I do see some some uh, energy being put into pump manufacturers with sound levels and trying to make that quieter. Um, it's still it's still not really dropping the numbers down below where you wouldn't need hearing protection around it. Electric actuators are are really very quiet around the 50 to 65 decibel range. To try to give you an idea of these number levels, if you're not familiar with it, that 50 range is normal conversation levels. Um, it may be even slightly higher, 55. A lot of times will be uh, like in a meeting with multiple people talking. 65 comes into a, you know, a moderate to heavy rain shower. So electric actuators are really, are really quite quiet. And when I looked at this, this was with rather aggressive ex uh, velocity profiles. When we move slower, that number can dip really uh, even much lower. Servo pump are those hydraulic, uh, are those hybrid hydraulic actuations. 55 to 85, uh, the reason it's slightly higher, you get towards that 85, was on those multi-axis systems or on systems that still required the oil to be cooled or chilled. It was actually the chiller or uh, heat exchanger that was making the majority of that noise. Surface life and maintenance considerations, uh, a little bit short and sweet here with pneumatics. Fairly low maintenance, especially when air quality is good. Uh, I don't see really good air quality in very many facilities, but if they're keeping it dry, keeping it clean, pneumatics really is pretty consistent and will and run relatively well without much maintenance. Even a moderate amount of dirt or moisture that gets into that air system, though, and this really does change into a highly, uh, a highly maintained or maintenance needed system doesn't take much. No matter how you shake a stick at it, even the best running system, you're going to have a seal on at least one end of the cylinder. If it's dual rotted, you're, you may have one on the opposite. And you've got seals on the piston itself, and those do wear with time. For hydraulics, um, similar with the cylinder seals, uh, I would say that it is more, it is uh, a little cleaner because it seems like those systems are maintained a little more regularly because of that oil life. If the oil gets old or the oil gets dirty, much like pneumatics, this can become quite the system. All of this said, the number one thing I hear when people are talking about a hydraulic system are leaks, 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 especially if you have hoses that need to move in order for that actuation uh, to take place. Servo pump or uh, hybrid systems, again, uh, slightly less maintenance than the traditional hydraulic system, and this comes down to that oil life again. We're not shearing that oil across the relief valve. We're not generating heat. Oil lasts a lot longer. In fact, many of these systems I'll see only sitting on top of 10 to 30 gallons of fluid. Uh, so what they'll use is a higher, a better quality oil to begin with, and then uh, 
and they're, they're much more willing to change that oil out and keep it clean. Electric actuators, very low maintenance. Some actuators do require occasional lubrication depending on uh, application requirements and the type of actuator we choose. But many of the actuators that we carry uh, are sealed for life. And, and part of the sizing considerations that we make uh, when I'm sizing it or when, whether we're helping you size it is the total the total life and you typically in inches of travel then we look at the the actuation but a lot of times there's absolutely nothing to be done with it in life uh, I've been doing this the motion roll long enough now where I have I some of my early systems they should be coming towards the end of their life and when we visit and I just sort of inquire how those electric actuators are doing they've been running non-stop multiple shifts and they have no intention they say they, it's just as good as the day they put it in so those calculations are, are usually pretty conservative uh, even though they're already attractive with that uh, conservative consideration on life so we're kind of coming to the tail end of this in the end what system is right for you well you know I didn't come right out and just say one is better than the other. If you have a small pneumatic cylinder that's really not using a lot of air, you've got good quality air, uh, it might make sense to put another cylinder in place. It's, it, they're certainly pretty pretty low cost. Same for hydraulics. If you're getting the performance you like, you're, maybe you're not using a lot of oil, you're needing to move really, really fast and push really, really hard, that might be the right app, the right, uh, the right solution for you. That being said, there's a lot of places where electric actuation makes sense, especially when you look at those total facility needs and, and control dynamics. And now we've got things to go both fast and with that high force. We just have to be careful about how we look in the middle. Hopefully you can see with uh, the topics I've discussed, maybe where it would work, where it makes sense. I've intentionally left a lot of product types out of this conversation, and I really wanted to make it more about uh, the different technologies. But know that uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to the account manager or one of the motion specialists myself. I'm happy to discuss it further. And then we've got a lot of products to help with that migration uh, to see you, uh, to offer you for electric actuation, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, most of the specs that I talked about today with the electric actuation were Tolomatic and Siemens, but we do have a lot of other things we can talk about. And with that, I'm transitioning into uh, question time if anybody has those. Thank you, Jay. A lot of good information there. Um, we don't have any questions right now, but we'll give the participants a uh, minute or so to type any into the question box if they have any that come to mind. And while we're waiting on that, uh, as Jay mentioned, if you have applications that you need to have reviewed or just uh, uh, need somebody to come out and, and take a look at, at what you're trying to accomplish, we've got uh, actually 12 specialists on staff. Jay is one of the motion guys, but we have motion specialists, automation specialists, vision specialists, um, machine safeguarding and so we've got folks that can come in and take a look at what you're trying to accomplish and they get to focus on those subjects those topics all day every day and so they get pretty good at uh, understanding uh, the products and, and the best way to solve problems using those products and so we don't charge for that service it's just part of what CE &E does So with that, Jay, I do not see any questions, so we will go ahead and end the webinar. I thank you for attending, and don't forget next month's webinar uh, on September 13th, and that will be using the web server to uh, commission your G120 drive. All right, uh, Rob, I see your, you said no questions at this time, but you'd like to look into cost on some upcoming applications, you'll contact us in. That'd be great. Yeah, just contact your uh, salesperson and, and Jay or one of the other motion specialists can come in and take a look at it with you. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Jay. Thank you.